filed a lawsuit. What's this, what's this case tell us? A couple of things, really. First, because that case was brought by a teacher, right? So Pico brought by parents, Hazelwood brought by students who wanted to write the newspaper. Now we've got a case brought by a teacher. Boring tells us one thing pretty clearly, explicitly. Teachers in the K-12 context do not have a constitutional right to select and control the material that they teach. Now note particularly what that case was about. Was it about teaching math, science, some kind of a hard discipline, a hard academic discipline with objective, definable criteria? It was about drama. That's about the most non-hard science discipline you can imagine. Drama, literature, even some of the social sciences, even in that context, teacher doesn't have the right, the academic freedom is the term you'll hear, doesn't have a constitutional right to select and control those materials. The second thing we can discern from Boring toward the end of that opinion, the court goes out of its way to note that the accuracy of materials matters. The objectivity and the veracity of them matter, and those are relevant considerations. Last case we'll talk about, ACLU versus Miami-Dade. This is from the 11th Circuit. That's the Federal Circuit Court that covers Florida and Georgia. And as you can tell from the name, the case arose in the Miami area. Long story and long opinion made short. A number of parents in the greater Miami-Dade metropolitan area objected to the inclusion in school libraries of a series of books, and one in particular, talking about life in Cuba. Now, you can imagine, for demographic reasons, that the population in and around Miami might have a particularly strong sense of what they think about books about Cuba, many of them either of Cuban descent, some of them, in fact, Cuban immigrants or refugees. Their complaint was that the book, in their view, painted an overly rosy depiction of life in Cuba and didn't acknowledge or depict the hardships of life in Cuba under the communist regime. Case goes up to the 11th Circuit, and the holding, relevant to our purposes, is that a school board can remove library books if it determines that the books were educationally unsuitable due to factual inaccuracies in the book. And again, if that sounds familiar to you, it's because we just saw that in this regulation. Let me bring the plane down for a landing, and I'll answer whatever questions you've got if I haven't bored you all to sleep. Pico, Hazelwood, Boring, ACLU. We could go on, but those are the four most relevant and simplest and most applicable today. What can we discern from them? Rules of law under which this draft regulation is perfectly aligned. It's legally defensible. We believe it's logistically feasible for districts and boards to implement. We believe it's educationally appropriate. We believe it's supported by scientific, medical, psychiatric, and psychological information. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. We appreciate um, the thoroughness of your presentation as well in presenting this regulation. Um, for our board members, um, you know, as a reminder during this time, if there are any specific questions for our presenter, just ask that we make sure we follow our own rules of order. Um, and please just um, wait to be called upon and then direct those questions to me. Um, and that if there's any questions specifically about the regulation in his presentation, any deliberation will come later. Okay. Are there any board members who have a question? Yes, Ms. Beverly Frierson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you said direct the question directly to you? That's okay. the way we should follow. Okay. But go ahead. Um, three questions that are very closely related. Mm -hmm. um, the presenter mentioned that when the regulation was drafted, librarians, teachers, parents, and others were included. Mm -hmm. My question is, um, what process was used to select those representatives? Okay. Was that process advertised, and how many librarians were included? Okay. Mr. Coleman, are you able to answer to that um, as far as the process when this was written? Sure, to the extent I can address that, there was no formal process of seeking or soliciting comment. There was no need to. The comments came in all on their own. There were informal conversations. I know, for example, one of the librarians, I believe he stepped out now, 
testified uh, during the public comment portion, but just a number of conversations that various people have had informally, in, in dialogue, unsolicited, over the past. And I have one question, if you don't mind, just uh, in regard to that same thing. I think just making sure we understand the process we go through as far as the regulation process. And so it's my understanding, and just to make sure we clarify um, for our board members, that once a first reading is approved is when it can go into draft form, where then a formal feedback process will be underway. Is that correct? Right. That, that'll initiate the statutory, what's called the notice and comment procedure, where members of the public and interested parties can submit comments to be considered, evaluated, and either incorporated or responded to uh, as this body deems appropriate. All right. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Are there any other questions? Yes, Ms. Allison. Uh, Madam Chair, I have a, a question just to clarify in my own mind how this is handled procedurally. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, um, I think we all know, and for those that don't know, the South Carolina House and Senate took up the um, Transparency and Integrity mm -hmm. Education Act. They went through a process of, of hearings, 18 hours of hearings, um, drafted legislation, it passed the House and passed the Senate with some uh, um, changes, and therefore it is in a conference committee right now. That conference committee is sitting, has not met yet, but would think uh, that they would probably meet around the 1st of January. A lot of things that are in this reg are addressed in that legislation, and knowing that legislation overrides any regulations. If we handle this regulation moving along, how will those two things meet? And keeping in mind that once legislation passes, then regulations are usually come about then, and then they go through a regulation process, usually in the House, and the House gets another bite at them. So. I'm trying to get all that straight in my mind. Right. Can someone clarify yes. that for me? Mr. Coleman, could you clarify yeah. that? Ha ha happy to. Um, right, you're correct that there is pre-filed legislation that may or may not proceed expeditiously or not. If it does, then you're also correct that this regulation, just like any regulation, after it goes through the notice and comment procedure, will eventually itself have to make its way through both houses of the legislature. And presumptively, at that point, those on, uh, I, I shouldn't say the hill, those down the street or across the street, they'll know what they've enacted. They will have a chance to review this regulation and make sure it aligns with and conforms to what they've enacted. So there's kind of that, that built-in harmonizing um, mechanism in the process itself. Thank you, Mr. Coleman, and I've, I've been through this twice with you today, and you've done a wonderful job. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, Ms. Frierson. I have one Beverly other question, <laughs> Madam Chair. On page four of the proposed draft, uh, Roman numeral four in that first paragraph, where it says, beginning August 1, 2024, any person residing within the school district attendance area or a parent or legal guardian of any student who attends a school within the school district shall have the right to file a complaint, et cetera. When Mr. Coleman was making the presentation, I think he said that nothing precludes um, there being a process whereby conversation is held first. Mm -hmm. My concern is, uh, he mentioned fair process and due process. If it is not clearly outlined whether it's required that the conversation come first, I'm concerned that we might be setting up ourselves for a violation of due process or fair process if certain things are not clearly defined. Mm -hmm. Mr. Coleman? Can you speak to that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you for mm -hmm. the question. Let me give an analogy that I think might be helpful. Let's imagine that Greenville County decides it wants to extend the Swamp Rabbit Trail a little bit further than it's already gone. 
And unfortunately, my house is in the way. They post a notice of eviction and taking on my house, informing me that they're taking my house for a public purpose, and they'll pay me whatever they think it's, it's worth. Now, at that point, I've got two options. If I want to, I could sue the county for an unlawful taking of my property without just compensation. Or if I wanted to, I could call up the guy that I know on county council, and I could say, Stan, what are you doing? Find another way to extend this trail. You can go take somebody else's house, not mine. I put a lot of money into this place. And then if he said, sorry, nothing I can do, then I could sue the county. Does that make sense? I have the option of picking up the phone, making that personal contact, and trying to reach agreement informally before I bring a more formal proceeding. But I don't have to do it. I could just bring the formal proceeding. It's a little bit similar here. Now, obviously, the analogy isn't a perfect correlation. But if a parent wants to initiate a formal proceeding, they can. That doesn't mean there's no option for them to go and try to talk and reach informal agreement, but they don't have to do that. If they want to, they can. It might even be a great idea, but it's not, they're not obligated to do it. Because they're not obligated to do it, if they don't, if they just simply proceed to bring a formal action, and that's within their legal right, and there's no due process or procedural unfairness component there. Does that, I, I, I hope that's helpful. It's helpful, but what you just said makes my point. If the option exists, but we don't clearly outline it's optional as not required, when we are dealing with the appeals process, in my opinion, then we have a problem because in certain instances, certain things may have been followed, and in another instance, certain things will not be followed because it was optional. And so it just seems for clarity and transparency, it needs to be clearly stated because especially if you're dealing with an appeals process, we want to avoid the inconsistencies. That's just the way I look at it. I, I, I think I understand, and I, let me make sure I stay in my lane. I think probably, as I understand the procedure, there will be a vote later to conclude the first reading. That will initiate the public notice and comment right. procedure, and then there will be a period of time, either 30 or 60 days, when, when that thought process, and I'm sure there will be others, can be considered. And it might be, maybe as you say, maybe, maybe this group decides, oh, we should, we should add a few words there to say it's optional but not required to go talk to the teacher or the principal first. That, that'll, that'll be a decision for this board and it's considered judgment to, to make. But I, I, I certainly hear your point and, you. and, and, I, and I can't really give you an up or a down or yes or no on that. I'll leave that to the group. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Are there any other questions? Yes, Mr. Walters. And Madam Chair, I hate to do this. I talked so much this morning and I think we kind of maybe got a little far out in the weeds, but I just wanna make sure I've got a clear understanding of this. Okay, uh, and please others do. do too. So it's part of what we had discussed this morning is that an appeal to the state board is de novo. We start over. Uh, the complainant can just say, I appeal my local board's decision without substantiation or anything. And it would initiate a process that we would have to determine. But so in that, and what, as you went through your presentation this time on page five, paragraph D, and uh, this down toward the bottom of that, uh, where it says, if the state board finds existing instructional materials identified do not satisfy the requirements, then it says what the state board can do. You see where I'm talking about? And uh, it says, the state board shall instruct the district board to remove entirely or discontinue use of said materials for any grade level or age for which such use is inappropriate or unsuitable. So we're not if I'm understanding correctly, we're not bound to up or down. We can come up with a modified verdict, if you will, on it and say that, no, we're not saying it should be taken out in its entirety. It should be restricted to AP English class or something. Yes. You've got at least three options there. One is to say, this material is so beyond the pale, it has no place in any school district in the state, gone. Option two would be, as you said, we think this is appropriate for upperclassmen, or we think this is appropriate for high school students, but not middle and, and below. Option three would be recognizing, consistent with well-established Supreme Court precedent, the fundamental right of parents 
to control and supervise the education and upbringing of their children, we think this material could be age and developmentally appropriate and supportive of state standards and could be useful so long as parents consent to it. So you've kind of got that third option there too where it could be available subject to parent parental consent. That was a long-winded way of saying yes. <laughs> That's what I wanted to hear. Actually, I wanted to hear the longer-winded version of it, so thanks for that. You, you can be sure I'll always give you the long-winded version <laughs> if I can. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Yes, Ms. Allison. So, Madam Chair, I have one more question. So, um, pinging off of what he just said, let's just say that our, our schools have lots of clubs in them. You have a literary club. Are they, uh, how would that, a book selection come about with that under the same thing? Would the same thing apply to it? Well, I'll give you the longer answer, too. Okay. Um, let me find the right page. In the definition section, I believe it's definition B, uh -huh. instructional program. So that's defining the scope to which this applies. It refers to courses, activities, and programs that are offered, supported, or sponsored by a public school, and it goes on. If it's a school-sponsored or supported extracurricular activity, if it occurs on school grounds or in the school day, it's got a faculty representative, I'm just kind of riffing off the theme here, but you get the point. Right. Then, then that's an instructional program of the school, and the materials so they use would need to be to subject it. to this. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Are there any other questions for Mr. Coleman? Yes, Ms. Lamb. I have a question. So if there is a section or story or something in a third grade ELA, I'm supposed to talk to you, um, books that were purchased through the state that come down to the schools and it is challenged so we can't use the book at all and anything in it or are we allowed to be able to teach around it and not have to find other resources? Right. Mr. Coleman. As a practical matter, well, let me pause to say what I'm about to say is a little bit speculative because I'm not a subject matter expert in that textbook selection, the mechanics of it, if that makes sense. Um, from a practical standpoint, I, I don't know if that scenario would arise. I'm not, I'm not saying it couldn't, I, I just don't know. But I think theoretically, the textbooks will now be subject to that same requirement. Um, as far as if it's an existing material with a discrete and by discrete, I mean sort of like defined and specified portion. I'm probably going to defer that to pe that, the answer to that question to those above my pay grade. I don't mm -hmm. know if it, it seems like you, your option would be either to excise that portion of the material or not to use the material. There could be a third option I'm not thinking of. I'm just answering you mm -hmm. extemporaneously. But I think, again, as with... Uh, Ms. Frierson, to your right, I think those are questions that would be perfectly appropriate to consider and address in this group's deliberation during the notice and comment period to think through the implementation of it. The, the, the last thing I'll add, and this isn't directly responsive to your question, it's tangentially responsive to it, but it's something that I mentioned this morning, I think in response to Dr. Johnson's question, that I think may be additional helpful context, is that the paradox of statutory drafting or, or regulatory drafting is you can never put enough words on the page clearly enough and long enough to address all the situations. You, the goal is to give clear enough guidance, clear enough standards, but there will always be the necessity of applying the law to the facts. And that's a great example of where we'll have to figure out in implementation, how does this? How do the? How do these standards apply to a particular? It, it could be a fact-specific situation, if that makes sense. I'm kind of not answering your question, but I'm kind of also saying, I can't. It would. It would depend in part on the specifics of the, of the book, the materials, and the situation. And I know, Ms. Lynn, you know, in the last page, it does also reference that the requirements of the regulation will supplement the process by which we select and approve textbooks for the future. But I know you were talking about if you already had one, and I do think that's something we would revisit at that time. Are there any other questions? Thank you so much. We appreciate you being here today. And 
so thoroughly explaining that and answering all the questions that we had before us. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. Happy to help. Thank you. All right. Now, with no other questions for our speaker, um, we will entertain a motion um, regarding this first reading. Madam Chair, I would move that we go forward with the first reading of proposed State Board of Education Regulation 43-170. We have a motion from Mr. Walters. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. Um, is there any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor, please vote by signifying saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries. So we will move into the next phase. And I believe I'm correct in saying that the draft regulation will have specific directions written for how to provide that written feedback once it is posted. Correct. Thank you. All right, next on our agenda today, we have our Safe Schools Facility Grant. And at this time, I would like to recognize Deputy Superintendent Laura Bain from the Division of Strategic Engagement to present that information to us. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair, board members. It's a pleasure to be before you today. I have provided the list to each of you for the recommended allocations for the Safe Schools Facility Grant, Proviso 1.81, a lot of the department $20 million to grant out to school districts for facility upgrades aligned with school safety priorities. We partnered with law enforcement entities, such as our friends at SLED, to go through each of the applications given to us by local school districts. And the list before you is representative of our recommendations with theirs. We were able to allot the full $20 million, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. And I was just going to point out, anyone who would like to pull that up, that is under the state board section, mm -hmm. um, under full board for approval, if you'd like to pull the list up that she's referencing. Are there any questions from Madam Spain? Chair, yes. I don't have a question, but I just want to applaud them for doing this, being a I, former I uh, retired principal. This is so important. So thank you for finding these funds and getting mm -hmm. them where it's needed. Yes, ma'am. I'll pass your thank you to our legislature as well. They were instrumental in these funds. And I, I would want to reiterate that on behalf of, because <laughs> virtually everyone did receive something. And this was as nice an effort. Because, you know, schools have changed. Some schools that we have or in the 50s and 60s, and back then things that we consider today are, weren't thought of then. And thank you for this for us and, and many other districts as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Matt, you know I have to speak on this. No, I know. It's this is day, your it's, wheelhouse. It's my day job. I, I get so, it, Mr. And, Walters. And I'm just I'm <laughs> delighted that... Yeah. that the appropriation was there, that Superintendent Weaver and her team of folks uh, who have law enforcement experience were able to get this out there, go through, find where the needs are. And I think this is uh, just the first step, not the last in it. And I'm looking forward to what comes ahead with it. And I'm just so excited that all of these districts were able to be accommodated. I also need to put on the record, Madam Chair, before we vote, my district's application is in there, so when I vote, I'm recusing myself from my district's application. I'm just voting on the rest <laughs> Thank of you it. very much. As and, I well, and, yes, and Dr. O'Shiel, so we'll make sure that is reflected in the minutes for but both I do want to say thank you to the two gentlemen at the back. <laughs> they went yes. and did a yeoman's job of going place to place to place to place and listening and looking and seeing. Mm -hmm. So both of those gentlemen deserve a special commendation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. All right. If there are no other questions, we will entertain a motion to approve the Safe Schools Facility Grant information you have before you. Motion to approve. Except for Lauren's. Except for mine. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else has to do that. But I'll move to approve that one. <laughs> well, we have uh, more than one motion. So we have Dr. Hanley, and then I know I heard a second from uh, Ms. Allison as well. Um, is there any discussion? Okay. 
All in favor, please vote by signify. I can't know why they keep saying that wrong today. Please vote by saying aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Great. That motion carries. Next on our agenda, we have for information, um, Dr. O'Shields is going to share with us the state board meeting dates for 2024. Four. <laughs> yes, each of you who are here today has received a copy of the 2024 meeting dates. If for some reason you haven't or you don't see it, I pulled it up here. Um, it's following the same schedule that we normally would for 2024. I think it's that second Tuesday. So what we're looking at is if you don't see it, don't have it, please see Tracy at the end of today's meeting. Um, also note that the state board will not meet during the month of July, but depending on certain exigencies or other educational issues, we may, may reserve the right to meet in July. Um, attendance is optional for the South Carolina State Read-In at the State House on Thursday in April. We don't know the date yet, but when we get that, we'll let you know, as well as the South Carolina Teacher of the Year Banquet at the Governor's Mansion on Tuesday, April 25th. That one we do know. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that information. Are there any questions regarding that? Okay, then we will move forward with our literacy update and our updates regarding Allendale County and Williamsburg County School Districts. And I believe we have one, someone different than Matthew Ferguson here <laughs> to share that with us today. Yes, Madam <laughs> Chair, um, and thank you for the opportunity to update the board on behalf of Deputy, Super Deputy Superintendent Matthew Ferguson, who is out um, at another meeting trying to be in too many places at the same time um, and representing him. I did try to wear a bow tie. I know he typically does which is as close as, as I could come. So I'm channeling my inner Matthew here. A couple of updates for you. First of all, and I know this is, has been discussed a little bit today, but we did also want to talk to you um, briefly about instructional materials and where we are with that. Um, the public is invited to review textbooks and instructional materials that have been proposed for use in South Carolina public schools. And those materials are currently on display at eight locations um, from November 3rd to December 4th um, with instructions for submitting comments from the public available at each of those sites. In addition to those eight display sites, digital access from all of the publishers um, they have provided links. Those are posted online on the State Department of Education website under 2023 public, a virtual public review. And um, due to the large number of texts and, of course, lots of grades uh, represented there, um, that virtual option we just wanted to note does provide citizens an opportunity to view those texts. Um, textbooks without the restrictions of when those building sites are open. So they're available 24-7, um, and the public comment section is, is right at the top there as well. So it does give folks the opportunity to look at all the materials at their convenience, and that is available now. Um, materials that are recommended by the Instructional Materials Review Panels um, will be submitted to the State Board of Education. Um, on December 12th, 2023, or at your next meeting, I might have gotten that date wrong, sorry, um, that you will receive the public comments before any decisions are made on adopting instructional materials. So you'll have all of that information um, to inform your decisions. Um, and just by way of information, selections by districts will take place in the spring following that, and then you know, with the formal adoption happening for those materials in the summer. Regarding letters training, we are finalizing the letters cohort, uh, which will begin in January. We have a January cohort about to begin. And once that January cohort begins, uh, we will start recruiting for cycle three, and that cycle will begin in the fall. So we are up and going and continuing to train um, teachers with letters training. Additionally, we'll be sharing a little bit later this week uh, with our education deans that we now have a January cohort for university faculty members at each of our teacher prep programs in the state yes. that is coming available in January. And so we are really excited about that. We think that is a fantastic development and just wanted to give you a little sneak peek that that is coming and will be announced to them this week. 
Um, regarding Allendale and Williamsburg, um, we have been convening across office teams that are meeting and working with the teams from both Allendale and Williamsburg. Office directors and offices um, represented on that team include the Office of School Transformation, Early Learning and Literacy, Educator Effectiveness and Leadership, along with, with many others. Um, the work has been focused on ensuring that any plans and approaches um, are designed and developed with, not for, those district teams. And so it really has um, been a collaborative and cooperative effort, and we are excited about the work that's happening there. And, and as a result of the work coming from those teams, we are learning lessons that will serve as a model for improving the collaboration um, and the community-centered approaches um, of the offices here at the department. And so we, we are learning a lot as we are working together. And graciously, um, and we're, we're really excited about this as well, Superintendent Weaver has been able to identify some funding for a strategic and comprehensive pilot for additional districts to be able to join in the HOPE network. So we are really excited about the lessons we're learning, the ways that we are working with districts, and providing those wraparound supports to be able to truly tailor um, community-centered uh, approaches and implementation and making sure that we are partnering together in a really strategic way. And um, that is all that I have for you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions regarding that report? No, yes. Um, could you remind me what is the date that the Republic Review ends? Uh, December 4th, December 3rd, sorry. <laughs> I think it's midnight December 3rd, so it's December, <laughs> December 3rd, I'd say that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank right, you thank so you. much for sharing that information with us today. Regarding other business, I do ask all board members, if you have not turned in your travel forms, to please do so before you leave today. Um, and I believe that was the only other business before us, so I would welcome a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Oh my goodness. Um, I heard a Ms. Criminger motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor, please vote by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Including All right, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Including Lawrence.